Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 9, 2021 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic, after two very good weeks of at least 500 or and winning records both against the spread and straight up, this week for the fanatic, unfortunately, it was a uh, bit of a down week. First time in about two, first time in about three weeks, I had a down week. Both my against the spread and straight up picks. Uh, definitely my against the spread picks were dreadful. So many games, either the underdog outright won, I flopped, or they just covered so many close games, and either uh, like Jacksonville, Seattle, that was a big blunder on my part. I thought the Jags and the Seahawks, from what I had seen from Geno Smith, um, he had not played that well. They had scored very low as the Jaguars were improving. They get shellacked. Uh, Jags do 31-7. to They lose James Robinson to an injury. He's now day-to-day -day of a knee injury. Uh, so that's big. Um, Washington-Denver. I thought it might have been a field goal game. Fortunately, I guess I got Denver winning the game. But they won by 7 instead of 3.5. Um, Arizona-Green Bay literally comes down to... I had it at 3.5 before it moved up to 6.5 with Devontae Adams, uh, Mount Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Alan Lazard all being out for the Packers. And Robert Tunyon tearing his ACL. Best wishes to him as he recovers from a season-ending injury. That was three and a half. And if AJ Green turned turned around, I might have won that one. The Bengals. Shout out to Rick Miller, one of my uh, commenters. You know, one of the people that comment on my videos every week. Sorry, man, uh, for screwing you in your survivor pool. I think everybody pretty much had a great idea of the Bengals being, you know, the number one seed in the AFC, playing arguably one of the worst teams in the AFC, Jets. Starting a guy out of Central Michigan from a, a fifth rounder 2018, Mike White. Uh, everybody thought the Bengals should have easily rolled the Jets. And the Jets come back with a huge interception from middle line or outside pass for Shaq Lawson. Set up uh, Mike White for the game-winning touchdown and the Philly-Philly two-point conversion to win 34-31. Anybody out there that picked the Bengals in survival pool like I told Rick to do, uh, I feel sorry for you. But that's the fun of the NFL. You never would see that in college football. A 2-5 and five football team was poorly talented as the Jets with their backup quarterback that had never played a game beating the number one seed in the AFC. That would never happen. Um, so that was crazy. Uh, the Bucks saints game, that was nuts where uh, Tom Brady, or the Saints were kind of dominating defensively. Tom Brady is 0-3 against the Saints as a Buccaneer in the regular season. The one game where he won in the regular season, he didn't do that well either. But he, I, I believe they said he's had eight turnovers against the Saints through his three regular season games, the rest of the time he's been in Tampa against everybody else, he's had four total turnovers. So that's a pretty insane stat when you think about it. Uh, but of course, the big story was Jameis Winston uh, going down in the second, uh, in the early part of the second quarter. Uh, he, uh, what I found out is he has torn his ACL and has damage to his MCL, so he is now out for the season. And Taysom Hill was was out for the game, recovering from a concussion. So right now, and the Saints aren't going to look for a Cam Newton or any other type of veteran quarterback in that way. Uh, so it's either going to be Trevor Simeon or Taysom Hill for the rest of the season guiding the Saints uh, moving forward. But that was a shocker because I, I honestly thought when uh, the Saints hit, put in Simeon, the, the Bucks had the game won. But obviously Trevor Simeon did well enough. But also Brady had three turnovers. He had 16 points off three turnovers. They lost by uh, 20, or they lost uh, 36 to 27. 16 minus 9, they would have won if Brady didn't commit the turnovers, which led the points. And then finally, before I get into my, or I'm going my record, the other big thing was, to me, uh, Falcons-Panthers. That was a pretty competitive back-and-forth game. Kudos to the Panthers' defense for holding uh, the Atlanta offense in check, though they did have a big loss due to wide receiver Calvin Ridley uh, announcing later in the day before the game started that he is going to be taking an indefinite absence due to... Uh, mental health reasons so uh two things here personally i wish him the best um just like everybody else does lane johnson took a three week sabbatical of course for personal reasons dealing with mental health um for personal reasons i wish him the best but in a fantasy perspective wow for everybody to drive the calvin really that is a tough pill to swallow uh because i, I took him with one of my uh, top three four round pick i thought he was going to be a phenomenal receiver obviously he has his own personal issues to deal with but that is just a kick in the nuts for anybody that took Calvin Ridley in fantasy wise that's tough fantasy wise but personally I wish him the best of luck as he takes his indefinite absence
Um, so that's how I ended up with the four against the spread record, in my opinion. So against the spread and straight up this week, I went four and ten against the spread. Brutal, just awful week. I have the Giants plus ten and a half tonight. Let's see, you know, a lot of the underdogs won outright or just kind of covered. So maybe hopefully the Giants can cover that for me. Uh, and straight up, I went eight and six. Turnovers were the differences in Chargers, Patriots, Bucks, Saints, Cardinals, Pant or Cardinals, Packers, uh, Bengals, Jets, uh, and then the and then, and then of course Cowboys, Vikings. Who knew Cooper Rush could outplay Kirk Cousins? Cooper Rush. Is making eight hundred ninety thousand dollars. Kirk Cousins is making thirty one million dollars, and Cooper Rush outplayed the thirty one million dollar man. So, you know, it's an indictment on the Vikings and Mike Zimmer and his staff who went one of thirteen on third down. But straight up, I went eight and six, so that equals up to twenty eight point six percent against the spread, and straight up fifty seven point one percent. So, uh, definitely a piss poor uh, against the spread week. Straight up, I, if I get nine and six, I'll take it. I wish I could have got double digits. But obviously with the turnovers, like I said, a lot of those games and turnovers, if those turnovers don't happen, my straight-up week definitely turns out to be a much better perspective. And against the spread now overall for the year, I am 53-66-2 against the spread, which equals 44.6%. And straight up, I am now 77-44, and 44, which equals 63.6%. So definitely a downturn for the week. That 500 percentage I'd like for my against the spread. But it's still in reach, but it's gotten pretty far. We're at the halfway point. I got a long miles to go before i get into um a spot to where i can possibly get that so hopefully at this halfway point with about less about six percent about five percentage points to go hopefully i can string together three to six good weeks to get to that 50 percent range for against the spread straight up bit of a tough one like i said uh but 77 and 44 i'll take being around 64 percent hopefully with these picks this week knowing what we all know now after another week i can improve on that so that so and before I get into my picks, the buys this week are the Detroit Lions, the Seattle Seahawks, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the Washington football team. So if you have Jared Goff, if anybody has anybody on the lines, their kicker even, if anybody has anyone on the DeAndre Swift, if you have DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, the Seahawks defense, Jason Myers, uh, Tom Brady, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, the Bucks defense, Ryan Suckup, Gronk, OJ Howard, Cameron Brait, uh, Antonio Gibson, Terry McLaurin, Logan Thomas, Ricky Seals Jones, the Washington defense. If you have any of those players on your fantasy teams this week, bench them because they will not be playing this week due to the bye. All right, so time for my picks for each game. So on Thursday, when the two and five New York Jets travel to Indianapolis to take on the three and five Indianapolis Colts, the Indianapolis Colts are ten and a half point favorites in this game. Give me the Indianapolis Colts here to win straight up, but I am going to take the New York Jets plus ten and a half. Then the next game, when the 4-4 four four Cleveland Browns travel to Cincinnati to take on the 5-3 Cincinnati Bengals, the Cincinnati Bengals are 2.5-point favorites in this game. Give me the Cincinnati Bengals here, minus 2.5, and, and the Cincinnati Bengals straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-4 four four Denver Broncos travel to Dallas to take on the 6-1 Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys are 8-point favorites in this game. Give me the Dallas Cowboys here, minus 8, and the Dallas Cowboys straight up. Then the next game, when the 1-7 Houston Texans travel to Miami to take on the 1-7 Miami Dolphins, the Miami Dolphins are 7-point favorites in this game. I am going to take the Miami Dolphins here minus 7 and the Miami Dolphins straight up. However, for all my viewers out there, and I'm going to put this out in my video, um, I am still going to take the Miami Dolphins straight up. However, Tyrod Taylor was actually activated off from practice uh, last week. So he has been able to practice throughout the week, and he felt pretty good. I don't know why the Texans didn't play him against the Rams, but obviously um, he is in lining up to come back as the starter. And with Deshaun Watson still not doing anything, and him possibly being traded by tomorrow, who knows? But if Tyrod Taylor is starting, I'm going to at least tell everybody right now that I'm going to change my against the spread pick to Houston plus seven. I'm going to take the Dolphins to win straight up, regardless if Tyrod Taylor is starting or not. But I'm going to take the Houston Texans plus seven if Tyrod Taylor is starting. But right now, since we don't know, and if it's Davis Mills, I'll take the Dolphins for minus seven. Um, next, the next game, when the three and four Atlanta Falcons travel to New Orleans to take on the five and two New Orleans Saints. The New Orleans Saints are five point favorites in this game. Give me the New Orleans Saints here to win straight up. But I'm going to take the Atlanta Falcons plus five. Then the next game, when the five and two Las Vegas Raiders travel to New York to take on the two and six or three and five new york giants the las vegas raiders are three point favorites in this game giving the las vegas raiders here minus three 
and Las Vegas Raiders straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-4 four four New England Patriots travel to Carolina to take on the 4-4 four four Carolina Panthers, the New England Patriots are three-point favorites in this game, giving the New England Patriots their minus three, and the New England Patriots straight up. Then the next game, when the 5-2 Buffalo Bills travel to Jacksonville to take on the 1-6 Jacksonville Jaguars, the Buffalo Bills are 14-point favorites in this game. Buffalo has been able to cover these massive spreads at a good clip. The Jaguars are not a very good team, so I'm going to take the points here. I'm going to lay the points, giving the Buffalo Bills here minus 14, and the Buffalo Bills straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-4 Minnesota Vikings go to Baltimore to take on the 5-2 Baltimore Ravens, the Baltimore Ravens are 5.5-point favorites in this game. Give me the Minnesota Vikings here to cover, plus 5.5, but I'm going to take the Baltimore Ravens straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-3 Los Angeles Chargers travel to Philadelphia to take on the 3-5 Philadelphia Eagles, the Los Angeles Chargers are three-point favorites in this game, giving the Los Angeles Chargers your minus three, and the Los Angeles Chargers straight up. Then the next game, when the 7-1 Green Bay Packers travel to Kansas City to take on the 4-4 or 3-5 Kansas City Chiefs, the Green Bay Packers are actually three-point underdogs in this game. That is probably, to me, the easiest money line to pick the whole weekend. Give me the Green Bay Packers here, plus three, and the Green Bay Packers here straight up to win this game outright as three-point underdog. That, that to me, is just stunning. But I'll explain to that later. Then the next game, when the 7-1 Arizona Cardinals travel to San Francisco to take on the 3-4 and four San Francisco 49ers, the Arizona Cardinals are two-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. Give me the Arizona Cardinals here, minus two-and-a-half, and the Arizona Cardinals straight up. Then in the Sunday night game, when the 6-2 Tennessee Titans travel to Los Angeles to take on the 7-1 Los Angeles Rams, the Los Angeles Rams are 6.5-point favorites in this game, giving the Los Angeles Rams here minus 6.5, and, and the Los Angeles Rams straight up. And finally, in the Monday night game, when the 3-5 Chicago Bears travel to Pittsburgh to take on the 4-3 Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, so on the website I use, Odd Sharks, they did not have the Monday night game still up uh, the, the money line, surprisingly. So I took this line from FanDuel. As soon as I get a line from Odd Sharks, the website I use to make all my against spread predictions, I will put that line. I will put that line in to replace the four and a half. But right now at four and a half, I will take Pittsburgh here minus four and a half, and Pittsburgh straight up to win on Monday Night Football. All right, so time for my thoughts on each game. The Indianapolis Colts over the New York Jets. Look, the Jets, two of the last four weeks have put, pulled off upsets against two teams with five or more wins. Nobody thought they would have beat the Titans, even with Julio Jones and A.J. Brown being out. And nobody, especially after getting shellacked by the New England Patriots 54-13, losing by 41 points, and the Bengals, the way they had been rolling, they blew out the Lions, they blew out the Ravens, they had close games against the Packers and Bears. You would have thought going into the game, the Bengals would have just rolled over the Jets. Especially when we found out that Zach Wilson was going to be out for at least two to four weeks. Um, with the PCL injury, but Mike White had over 400 yards in about the last 20 years. He's the first quarterback in 20 years to have a 400-plus yard passing made for the New York Jets. He had the most completions ever for a first start, and he's only the second or third quarterback in NFL history since 1950 as a rookie, and in his first start, throw for over 400 yards. And he's the only one that, that is Cam Newton, and that's insane. Like, that, like to me, that, that was the, the upset of the year. The Jets had the two biggest upsets of the year just to do the how they've been playing. Um, they didn't even have Corey Davis. Um, another one of the Jets defenders was out. C.J. Mosley did play, which was big. But that was really impressive by Robert Sala and the Jets. And you could look at the Jets and go, that like, they are just going to fight for this guy. They are going to fight for this team all, all, all the way through. But the problem for me is they're taking on a Colts team that played pretty well against uh, Tennessee overall. They limited Derrick Henry to under 80 yards. They did a phenomenal job run defense-wise. Carson once played a pretty efficient game through about 85% of it. Essentially, he threw the game away with the horrible three-yard left-handed pop-up interception to uh, Am Amari Hooker. Uh, um, yeah, not, not Malik Hooker, the former Colt, um, ironically. But he threw that one, then he threw the second interception uh, to Kevin Byard off that horrible out route where he had Jonathan Taylor wide, wide open in the middle of the field. And the Colts, they lost uh, to Rell. Basham or Terrell, or Terrell Lewis, one of their defenders. Uh, T.Y. Hilton also left the game with a concussion, so I think this is going to be his final year of Indianapolis. 
just because that um, unless he takes a shorter deal, because he's just been getting nicked up and leaving every game every week since he's dealt with that neck injury back all the way in week one. But I really look at this Colts team and go that even with all the injuries they're suffering, they already ruled T.Y. Hilton out for this Thursday. I just have a feeling with the Jets because after what they did against the Titans, they played a good game against the Falcons. In a way, I knew Zach Wilson threw another interception. Uh, but the Jets really, I don't think, you know, they've been able, able to string back-to-back -back good games together. And I just think the Colts, I think they're more polished. They have a better offensive line. I don't think the Jets' pass rush will be able to get to Joe Burrow, unlike they did with Carson Wentz. I, I do think that Carson Wentz may be more prone to mistakes, which could be huge for the Jets. And also, I just don't know if Mike White, after what a sensational game he had in, in his first game, even though he didn't give it three turnovers, as the quarterback, and they were actually tied after the Jets pretty much won the first quarter. And maybe that was an omen for the game, but the Jets kind of dominated through the first quarter. But due to Mike White's three turnovers, uh, they they were basically in a dead heat, and it was fourteen seven. But I just look at the Colts and go, they are a dominant, a better offensive line. I think the Jets pass rushing defense will not nearly be as effective. I think uh, Michael Carter and. Uh, Ty Johnson, their running backs, I don't think they're nearly going to be able to make as many in-space plays, or I think Darius Leonard, or Kurlele, um, or, I know, I know it's, it's, it's not Okereke, I know who's in the game, but those type of defenders, they have the Forrest Buckner, that defensive line should be able to generate enough push and pass rush to limit Mike White's ability to throw that well, I didn't think he was that great of an athlete, and I just think for the Colts, like, this is a game to where you, you played your heart out against the Titans. You have a huge opportunity with Derrick Henry's foot injury now and, and him being out for at least the, re the rest of the regular season pretty much. He could be back for the postseason if they make it, so that'd be huge. But at least for the regular season, Derrick Henry is pretty much out of commission. You get to play a Jets team that's kind of feeling themselves. It's a short week. It's a home game for you. You should be able to win off of those factors, even with T.Y. Hill and Paris Campbell already being out again uh, for this Thursday's game. However, I'm going to take the Jets plus 10.5 because I just don't know if Mike White. And if Mike White wins on Thursday, or wins on Thursday, if it's, he's able to play efficiently or they just wins the game, I'm going to say this. I know there could be a quarterback controversy brewing at Florham Park because if Zach Wilson comes back, and I he'll probably take the starting job regardless of what happens, and he stinks up the joint like he had been through the first seven, uh, through the first seven weeks, I'm not saying that Zach Wilson's going to get pulled at the end of this year. However, Mike White should, if I'm Robert Sala, okay, I'm going to say this to everybody, Robert Sala should give an open competition, I will say it again, an open competition to Mike White and Zach Wilson. If Zach Wilson sucks up the joint and plays horrible the rest of the year when he gets back, okay, it should be an open competition between Mike White and Zach Wilson. If Mike plays well against Indy, even if he loses, that's what Mike will have earned, in my opinion, through his starts. In that Mike White seems to be able to run the offense a little bit more efficiently, and he does not make nearly as many bad decisions as as Zach does, in my opinion, through the stretch. Okay, they did get some benefit from turnovers, but just the offense looked different and more efficient and more effective with Mike White in that game against a very good Bengals defense or against a good Bengals defense compared to Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson may be more purely talented, sure. But I, if, if I am New York, if Mike White can win or look good on Thursday, you're going to have a open competition theory moving forward with Mike White and Zach Wilson next uh, next year. Um, if Zach stinks up the joint again. So that's all I like the Indianapolis Colts here to win straight up with the New York Jets plus 10.5. The next game, the Cincinnati Bengals over the Cleveland Browns. I am taking the Cincinnati Bengals here. Uh, just based on the fact that I watched the Cleveland Browns yesterday, uh, the Ravens were off, but I got the Steelers-Browns game, and I saw the Browns, and they did not look that fantastic. Uh, you know, they're missing their corners. John Johnson, their starting safety, went out of the game. Jack Conklin dislocated his elbow, so that's their starting right tackle, maybe being out for an extended amount of time. Jedrick is still playing off a, you know, bum ankle. Odell's dealing with a shoulder injury. Uh, Nick Chubb, after being so dominant through the first few weeks, he got his lowest amount of rushing yards uh, through the season with 61. And I just look at the Browns and go, this is not a very good team. The tight ends, Hooper and Bryant made two, you know, nice catches, but they really didn't make that big of an impact. Njoku was basically a non-factor yesterday. And I just look at the Bengals and go, 
this game against the Jets, and it always just seems like with the Bengals, every week they have a tough game. They usually win their next game, or they play much better. And if the Bengals play up to the level, I've seen them against Baltimore. I've seen them against uh, the Jags, the Packers. I've seen them play against the, that better competition. They're better than the Cleveland Browns right now. Are they healthier? Sure, as well. Yes. But the Bengals, I just think, are a clearly more consistent t- team. They have the better quarterback right now. They have a healthier um, running or the healthier running back. They have a more effective wide receiving core with more depth. Uh, the Bengals defense, I think, should be able to get to Baker, especially with Jack Conklin, uh, Jack Conklin possibly being out. And also, I, I just feel like for the Bengals, they know, or Joe remembers last year, the games they were in. It took a 35-30 game week two, and it took Baker Mayfield hitting a game-winning touchdown pass to Donovan Peoples-Jones for the Bengals to lose those two games last year when the Browns were clearly the better football team and Joe was just a rookie. So I just feel like now in this kind of game, I know the, you know Baker has had a phenomenal career against the Bengals. He's, I think, won every game except one uh, in his three years in Cleveland against the Bengals. But I just think with the injuries they have, with the frustration at the offense of Baker playing through his torn labor and not being able to really move the ball you know, that well, I think with the Bengals' safeties and Vaughn and Jesse Bates and then you have their passer, I think the Bengals are just clearly and fundamentally a better team that will be motivated after getting embarrassed by the Jets to take it out on a division rival that essentially if you look at the Browns' schedule, and I'm being 100% honest, they really only have one legitimate win- winning, winnable game that they should win the rest of the year. I'm not saying they're going to lose out, but they do not have an easy game besides the one against the Lions. Uh, for the rest of the year, they still got the Bengals twice, the Steelers twice, or the Steelers again, the Ravens twice, the Raiders, the Packers. There's seven or eight games right there that you could just say that's going to be a tough day for the uh, Cleveland Browns fans and their team. Could the Browns be competitive? Sure, but I just feel like with Baker's injury, you're you know he threw for under under he threw for a little over 200 yards. He had the one great scramble, but that was it. And I just think again, Joe Burrow and them. They're going to be motivated to kick some rear end after blowing a game that they knew they shouldn't have. And just kind of the same thing with, like, after the Titans. The Titans won their next game. After they beat the Jets, they won a decisive game. I think the Browns and the very uh, the Bengals, excuse me, the Bengals in very much the same way respond to the frustration and play one of their better games against the Browns team that is a disappointment marred by injury, but still a disappointment to where if they're three and, if they're four and five with, if they're four and five with, uh, Eight games to go. It's not going to look great for the Browns and their playoff chances, especially how the AFC is shaping up. So that's like the Cincinnati Bengals here, minus two and a half, and Cincinnati Bengals straight up. The next game, the Dallas Cowboys over the Denver Broncos. I am taking the Dallas Cowboys here uh, because, okay, and I'm going to take the Dallas Cowboys. Last night, I, uh, or yesterday, I put out a pick update for anybody that watched the video or saw any of the comments from any of the, I changed my pick to the Vikings at uh, 7 o'clock due to the fact that Cooper Rush was playing. Because I I did not think that Kirk Cousins and the Vikings, even though, again, I did trust Kirk Cousins at primetime television, 8-19 career record, Mia culpa. That's my fault. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but I, I, I digress. I look, at the, I, I look at the Cowboys of Cooper Rush and go, okay, Cooper threw for 325 yards, two TDs, he had two turnovers. Uh, the one really wasn't his fault. That went off right off Dalton Schultz's hand. And a uh, fun fact, the Cowboys are the first team to have first name, uh, last name to first name, and first name to last name touchdowns in NFL history. Uh, with the Cooper rush to Amari Cooper touchdown and the Andy Dalton to Dalton Schultz touchdown, that's a pretty little fun, uh, weird NFL fact uh, to find out. But looking at the Cowboys and seeing how they played, I genuinely believe that if Dak plays or not, I, or, uh, that's what I'm going to say, this week I am not changing my pick from the Cowboys, regardless who is starting for the Cowboys if it's Dak or Cooper, I think they beat this Broncos team, who played okay against the Washington football team. I thought the Denver defense was sensational. They got two turnovers in Taylor Heineke, especially the one in the end zone that should have ended the game, but Vic Fangio kind of muffed it up, and Melvin Gordon fumbled the football, and the Washington football team had to get stopped on defense, on offense, for a second time after a game to where if they got the first down after the first after the second turnover, they should have been able to win the game. And it's just to me, when I look at Denver, uh, they lost, They might have lost Garrett Bowl, and the big news that just happened within the hour, uh, outside linebacker Von Miller has been traded to the Los Angeles Rams. 
for two 2022 for a 2022 second and third. So with Bradley Chubb still being out for a few more weeks, the Denver Broncos, I believe, will have no pass rush to get after Cooper Rush or Dak Prescott. I think that they're going to be able to run the ball effectively. I, I, I think the Cowboys' defense should be able to get a turnover to on Teddy Bridgewater, who um, has, who has not played nearly as effective and clean football as he has in the past. Um, do I think Denver has a chance? Yeah, I think that, you know, if it is Cooper Rush, who knows how he does against the Denver defense. But with Von Miller, being, Von Miller and Bradley Chubb being out, I don't really see a pass rush being that effective. And I think with the Dallas offensive line, even with Tyron Smith dealing with an ankle sprain, that might have him out for a couple weeks. Trayvon Diggs also suffered an ankle injury at the end of the game. From what I've read, he should be fine, so he should be able to play um, this Sunday against the uh, uh, against the Broncos. If you single Sutton or Judy, I would single Sutton. Let Jerry Judy and everybody else try to beat you. I feel pretty good in the Dallas defense against that banged up Denver offensive line, possibly out, but Garrett Bowles that they win this game at least by eight points. If Cooper Rush is playing, actually, no, um, strike that. So, yeah, I'm going to take, that's why I have the Dallas Cowboys here, minus eight, and the Dallas Cowboys straight up. The next game, the Miami Dolphins over the Houston Texans. Oh, man, this is one to where I am taking the Miami Dolphins because the Miami Dolphins, Outside of maybe the quarterback, I think I have more talent than the Texans. Uh, the Texans, they scored 22 unanswered points in the fourth quarter, but that was after the Rams basically pulled all their starters after being up 38-7 to through three quarters of the game yesterday. Um, and this one to me, like, again, it's tough where, like, if Tyrod Taylor is going to play, because essentially with Davis Mills, when they, he was out there, when the Rams were trying to give effort, they really couldn't do anything. He threw another pick. It was an abysmal performance, and they are genuinely, to me, the worst team in the entire league uh, outside of the Detroit Lions for how inept their offense and defense has been since Deshaun, had, since Deshaun and Tyrod haven't been there. But I'm going to take the Texans plus seven because I feel like if, if Tyrod's starting, because I feel like Tyrod can lift this entire team up. You saw it in week one against the Jaguars. Everybody thought the Jaguars were going to win because the Texans really weren't going to try to compete. With the, with the Texans, Tyrod Taylor was playing at a respectable an efficient level that was all the Texans needed to be able to move the ball and, uh, you know, win that type of game. And Miami is definitely a team that's on the Jacksonville level. Heck, Miami lost to Jacksonville. And it's just something to where, like, again, the defense, they really couldn't stop Josh Allen with his runs. Cole Beasley had third down after third down. Um, it was weird in the first half because I, I, I thought it was, you know, a very awkward slugfest of defense. The Dolphins' defense was fantastic as well. But at the end of the day, it's the Dolphins at home. I think Tua could outplay Tyrod or Davis. Definitely he'll outplay Davis, but he could outplay Tyrod in a situation or two. If Howard and Jones aren't going to you know, be moved, I think Tyrod's going to have a tough time against those corners along with the safeties in Miami. I like Jerome Baker for the Dolphins' defense. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to go with the better quarterback and just the better overall team, Brian. But Brian Flores, his... his Dolphins' career is over at, at a 1-7 and seven point. I do think that, you know, they play Baltimore on Thursday. You could argue you could fire him after that Thursday because being 1-9 and nine with seven games to go, being 8-9, and nine, that's not going to make a playoff team for the Dolphins regardless of what happens. They still have to play the Patriots again, some other games. But if it's Dolphins, I'll, I'll take Tua over Tyrod or Davis. Definitely over Davis, but Tua will play well enough. And I think the Dolphins' defense can get enough pressure on the Texans' offensive line to give Tyrod and Davis some frustration in order for the uh, Dolphins to win this game. Again, I'm going to take the Texans plus 7 if Tyrod plays, but if not, I'm going to stick with Miami minus 7. And with me not knowing, I will say in the video for right now, I, that's why I have the Miami Dolphins minus 7 and the Miami Dolphins straight up. The next game, the... New Orleans Saints over the Atlanta Falcons. This one to me, this is tough. Or well, let me put it this way. Okay. The reason why I'm taking the Saints is not because I believe that Taysom Hill or Trevor Simeon are better quarterbacks than Matt Ryan. They are not. Even though Matt Ryan, for the first time in his career, in 212 games, he had under 150 yards and one TD and two interceptions. That's the first time in his career he has put up that type of stat line across the board. 
Um, I just think that the key thing for me is I think the Saints team is just clearly better all the way around compared to the Falcons. The Saints have a better running game. The Saints have a better defense. The Saints have, with Calvin Ridley out, they have comparable receiving cores. I would argue the Saints have a better receiving core for some of the weapons they have because I would take some of those weapons over the Falcons' weapons without Calvin Ridley. The only one that you could argue that they have is tight end, and that's fair because I will take Kyle Pitts over Troutman and every other tight end. But yeah. But it's one of those things to where I think whoever's starting Taysom or Trevor, Taysom won the last time last year against Atlanta, kind of a similar fashion of, you know, running-based quarterback that can make some okay throws. He can make, he can slants, he can do the screens, he can do the uh, read option, RPO type of offense. And Trevor Simeon is 13-11. He did throw for 30 touchdowns and, you know, not a great amount, you know, 30 TD season over the two seasons in his 24 games as the Denver Broncos started this couple years ago after Peyton Manning left. And I just feel like if you look at the Saints and the Fa- you know the Saints and the Falcons, what team do I trust more organizationally to be able to mend the kind of a you know strategy together? It's Sean Payton because since 2019 he has played 16 games with three or I'm sorry you know with three different quarterbacks besides Drew Brees he is 13 and three in those games when Drew Brees is not behind center. That's 5-0 with Bridgewater, whatever record you have with Jameis, and Trevor Simeon coming in um, to win the game against Tampa yesterday. Do I think Atlanta has a shot? Sure, because I feel like with Atlanta, they've been competitive, they've been able to fight through most of their games, and I don't know Trevor Simeon now having basically no lead and having to play a full game by himself, with Jameis now being out for the year, if he starts or Taysom Hill. I just don't know if Taysom Hill and them are going to be able to run the ball effectively and make enough decisions for the uh, Falcons to cover a five-point game. Because I have Atlanta plus five and no one finished straight up. Um, I think it should be a very interesting game. I think the quarterback decision, whoever it is, um, should be able to hold on with the skill set, the confidence, and the experience they've had in this New Orleans system to be an Atlanta team that is a three and four football team and under five is and is under five hundred, but they are not. You know they play a little bit better than I think an under five hundred team. I just think the frustrating part is also the Atlanta collapsing syndrome still continues all the way through this year, and even yesterday with Matt Ryan throwing, throwing two picks. So that's why I like the New Orleans Saints here to win straight up. The Atlanta Falcons plus five. The next game, the Las Vegas Raiders over the New York Giants. I'm taking the Raiders here. They beat the Jets in MetLife last year. They've typically played the Giants pretty well. I think for me, the Raiders have a better running attack, better offensive line, and the Raider defense will get after Daniel Jones. I feel like they'll at least have one to two turnovers in this game, and I just can't trust the New York Giants after what, you know, last uh, two weeks ago to me was an aberration. I don't think the Giants are 22 points better than the Carolina Panthers, nor do I think they, they play particularly well through the stretch of that game. And I just feel like with the Raiders, like they've been humming a lot more lately. Derek Carr in his last game completed 91% of his passes. They're two and under, they're two and zero uh, under Rich Versace. And I just really like this Raiders team. Um, I, know, I know it's one of those things that you could argue it's the West Coast team going out to the East, playing a Giants team that has nothing to lose. And it's just, you know, kind of this scrappy competitive team. I just feel like with the Raiders, they've been in these kind of games before. And they've been able to win kind of close ones, or especially in that building. I think the Giants and Jets are more comparable, you know, to each other. And if at least uh, Derek Carr and Versace could beat the Jets at home off the last second big hail uh, Mary pass to Henry Ruggs, I definitely feel like they could beat the Giants, who are have a little bit more reinforcement coming back soon, possibly with Saquon and Kenny Galladay starting next week, which would help. But I think the Raiders, if Darren Waller comes back, they have a more complete offense better offensive line, and Derek Carr should be able to play Daniel Jones in a pretty easy and effective way. So that's why I like the Las Vegas Raiders here, minus three, and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. The next game, the New England Patriots over the Carolina Panthers. I am taking the New England Patriots here because I just believe the Patriots are playing at a better and more consistent rate compared to the Panthers. The Panthers got lucky, I felt like, to win that game against the Falcons yesterday. 
I think if Young Hoku makes the 45 yard field goal, the Falcons probably win the game because I think they're more motivated to get a stop. But as soon as he missed it and the Panthers, Chubba Hubbard, 80 yards of 20 carries, his best game as a pro all year. I just felt like that I'm like, okay, this game's over because there's no way the Falcons. I'm sorry, there's no way that the Panthers would, could blow a nine point lead with two minutes left to go. Um, and when I just look at the Patriots, Mac Jones, another 218 yards, uh, no TDs, no picks. He played a more efficient game. He didn't have the problem with turnovers like Justin Herbert did, who threw two picks to uh, the same player in Adrian Phillips, who ran it back for a pick six. That was the difference in the game. But I like the Pats here because I trust the defense better. I trust the offense better. I, I just can't trust with Christian Caffrey if he's going to be able to be healthy enough to go. Uh, I think Max going to outplay Sam. Sam Darnold's had a horrible history with the Patriots, even back, even just a couple years ago, back in the Jet days. I mean, from his he sees Ghost package, they shut him out the one year in a pretty horrifying fashion around Halloween week last year. I don't think they're going to do that with the Panthers. I just feel like with the Patriots, I'll trust Mac Jones and what he has around him offensively, his mind, compared to Sam Darnold or P.J. Walker, who, let's be fair, to P.J. Walker last year, he did start a game for the Panthers, and he actually was able to shout out the Detroit Lions 20 to nothing last year. So P.J. Walker has had a little tiny bit of experience starting games. Um, but I just feel like, again, with Mac Jones, Mac Jones is the higher ceiling, and I feel like Mac can definitely play a more efficient and solid game compared to Sam. Or PJ, who I think will at least have one or two turnovers in the game that causes the difference in the game for the Patriots to win. Could the Panthers win? Sure. I feel like if you know they can limit Damian Harris, if they could limit some of the other issues they have offensively. Robbie Anderson took a massive shot. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a better play by uh, Eric Harris compared to a helmet to helmet call. But I'm going to take the Pats here. They always have found some odd ways to win in Carolina. <laughs> Uh, and, and also a couple odd ways to lose as well, but I just feel like with the Patriots, they're humming a little bit more. They have, you know, all their guys coming back healthy. They have Mac Jones, efficient, consistent, and effective in the way he plays quarter, the quarterback position. Nick Folk's a phenomenal kicker. I like the Pats' defense. They got after Herbert a good amount, and Herbert only improved his passer rating by about 20 plus, a little over 20 points. So he's still not very good against the Pats' defense. And I just feel like against a experienced player like Sam that he's played several times during his early career, I think Bill will have a very good and decent scheme to confuse Sam Darnold to get into the same mistakes that you were talking about earlier, that I was talking about earlier with the uh, Raiders. So that's why I'm doing the Patriots here minus three and doing the Patriots straight up. The next game, the Buffalo Bills over the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jaguars are the worst, one of the worst teams in the league. Buffalo is one of the best. That's all I need to say about this game. I think Buffalo wins at least by 17 points. Uh, the Jags have already shown in some tough games that they, you know, don't really have the backbone to consistency to keep fighting. And I just feel like with this one, it's going to feel very much the same way. And I think the Bills are going to be a bit motivated because you do have the 2017 AFC Championship game or AFC Wildcard round. Tyrod against um, Blake Bortles. It was a weird game. The Jags won under defense. Hopefully, Devin Singletary did not forget that. Because I feel like he'll be motivated to run and play well against a Jags a Jags team that is just not very good. So that's like Buffalo here minus 14 and Buffalo straight up. The next game, the the Baltimore Ravens over the Minnesota Vikings. I am taking the Baltimore Ravens here to beat the Minnesota Vikings based off the fact that, to me... The Vikings just cannot win big games when it matters. Dalvin Cook was only held about a little under 80 yards. Uh, Kirk Cousins had two or three big throws to Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. They really weren't hurt the rest of the day. And the Vikings defense gave up way too many third down conversions. They, the Cowboys were at least half from third uh, on third down. They had You had the missed field goal by Greg Zerline for 40, a little over 40 yards. That, that was a killer. And I just look at the Vikings and go, even if they play really well against the Ravens defense, which, you know, two of the last three because they gave over 400 yards, they play, you know, an efficient running game, they get at least one or two turnovers. I feel like for the Vikings that they can definitely hang around, and that's why I have them plus five and a half. 
But I just feel like with the Ravens, they're coming off a bye. Harbaugh's usually great after a bye. And I think he understands the pressure and magnitude of winning this game because we are now, you know, fighting for the one seed with the rest of the schedule, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. I do not have that much confidence that Minnesota will be able to win that many more games after this one, where the Ravens, they get a very nice kind of cupcake game after this one going down I-95 to Miami next Thursday. But I'm going to take the Vikings plus 5.5 as well, just for one reason. Every game the Vikings have been in this year, every time he's made a pick, the underdog has usually covered the spread, and to me that is fantastically kind of like describing the Vikings to where like they have a losing record, but they have one of the better point differentials in the entire league. That is just perfectly describing the Vikings. But I, I'm going to take the Ravens because I feel like the Ravens, they don't lose that many off buys. And I feel like with the, the Vikings, they are horribly dejected because now they know that basically the NFC North, any aspirations of getting into the NFC North uh, division picture are now gone. So that's like the Baltimore Ravens here to win straight up. The Minnesota Vikings plus five and a half. The next game, the Los Angeles Chargers over the Philadelphia Eagles. I am taking the Los Angeles Chargers to win this game based off the fact that I'm going to trust Justin Herbert over Jalen Hurts. Could Jalen play a good game? Yes, and they definitely can run the football. Hopefully they learn from what they did last week. Hopefully everybody on the Eagles staff has been fertilized and given water so they can grow as human beings and flowers alike. Because after what happened yesterday with the Detroit Lions, that gave them a good amount of confidence. I know it's the Lions, you really can't put that, that much stock into it. But still a dominating blowout performance against a playoff contending team in the Vikings. I just feel like with that the Cow, uh, for the Vikings, it's all the way down from there. That's why I like Minnesota here, plus five and a half. Um, and uh, the Mono Ravens straight up. And let, let, me, let me get back to the Chargers and Eagles. Sorry about it. I think I just... Let me get back to Chargers and Eagles. I'm taking the Chargers here because I feel like for the Chargers, they are in a great spot to play an Eagle team that blew out the Lions and did it effectively. But I look at the Eagles and go, they're not going to be able to run the ball like they did against the Lions. And I think the Chargers' offensive line should be able to limit the Eagles' offense, uh, defensive line in a pretty good way. Uh, and very much so as well, one of the key factors, if you look at the Eagles this season, their linebackers and secondary have been awful. And the quarterbacks that they play, they get a lot of completions done through the air. Over 80% completion percentage for Patrick Mahomes, for Dak Prescott, for Tom Brady, and Derek Carr, who had 91% just two weeks ago. Jared Goff is not a great starting quarterback. He might not even be a great backup quarterback with the way he's been playing. And I just look at the Eagles and go, when they played talented offenses throughout the year at home, they gave up a lot to Brady. They gave up a lot to... Um, they gave up some to Garoppolo and the Niners. But the Chiefs and the Bucks on... On the road, have played the Eagles defense pretty well, and they have completed a lot of passes, made a lot of big plays, and I just do not see Jalen Hurts with the weapons he has, with the limited passing he has. I do not think they are going to be able to run the ball to oblivion. I think they will be able to run the ball somewhat because the Chargers have a very bad rushing defense, but I just think it's going to take more than that unless they get a turnover or two from Herbert, which I expect him to stop turning it over. Um, because over the last couple weeks, that's been a little bit of a tough trend. Uh, it's been a little bit of a tough streak that you've been seeing. But I feel like he doesn't get a turnover, and the Chargers play a more efficient game with Herbert passing and the potential he has for passing uh, to win this game. So that's like the Los Angeles Chargers here, minus three, and the Los Angeles Chargers straight up. The next game, the Green Bay Packers over the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't understand, like I said before, everybody out there, and, um, I don't, I don't get how the Packers are the uh, are the underdogs in this game. I know the Chiefs have a great offense, but they can't run the football. They don't want to run the football. And the Green Bay Packers, they're going to get Devontae Adams back. They're going to get Alan Lazard back. They're going to get Marquez valdez Scantling back. True, they lost Robert Tunyon, and they might want to go after a tight end. I might argue like an Eric Ebron. Trade for an Eric Ebron. He was inactive yesterday. He's only on the rest of his year contract now. 
Um, you have um, Cameron Brader, OJ Howard on the Bucks. You could they could, they could get in at tight end with Tunyon being out. I just feel like the Packers are just clearly the better football team. And even if you want to argue with the Chiefs, like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be fantastic. Mahomes and Rodgers going down the field in a shootout with both those defenses. I know the Packers defense has not been sensational and they've had some rough stretches throughout the year. But seeing what the Chiefs defense has been all year, it's not a very good defense. It's one of the worst in the league. You can run on them, you can pass on them, you can get penalty conversions, you can get all fourth downs. It's just a really bad defense. And in a game like this, even if you believe the Chiefs, are going to be playing well. Because remember, Patrick Mahomes, he's tied with Zach Wilson for the most turnovers in the league, surprisingly enough. Um, but I'm going to take the Packers here because I just feel like, again, even if both defenses don't play well, what defense do I think is worse compared to the Packers or the Chiefs? It's the Chiefs. So that's why I'm going to take Rodgers and his offense if it comes down to it to outshoot Mahomes. I don't think it's going to be that close, but even if it comes down to it, I just think the Packers... They should be the slight favorites. I would say they should be two to three point favorites. It should be a six point swing. But I think the Chiefs defense is that bad. And I just trust the Packers enough with the defensive playmakers they have. that They should be able to limit the uh, damage from the uh, from the uh, Packers struggles. I, I feel like the Packers defense should be able to limit the Chiefs offense enough that they get a turnover to or a stop. And it gives Rodgers more opportunities to go up against it. And Rodgers outscores Mahomes in this type of shootout. So that's like the Green Bay Packers here, plus three, and the Green Bay Packers straight up. The next game, the Arizona Cardinals over the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, I'm going to take the Arizona Cardinals here. They were literally A.J. Green away from beating the Niners. I thought Arizona, you know, San Francisco earlier this year, uh, just a few weeks ago, they played the Niner, they played the Cardinals on the road. Awkward game, Trey Lance's first start. I do think Jimmy could be a bit better. And Eliza Mitchell, the one thing you noticed about the, in the Packers-Cardinals game last week was that without J.J. Watt, who was out for the year with a uh, shoulder surgery, or let me say, he's out at least for the regular season. He could be back for the postseason, depending on how far the Cardinals get down in the postseason. I just feel like with the Cardinals, they're going to be ticked off, and they're going to take it out of the San Francisco team. I remember back in week one, uh, two years ago, everybody was kind of impressed with the, with the Cardinals going, you know, wait a minute here, what is this Cardinals team going to do? And you saw it, you know, on full display. And I just feel like, again, like for the Niners, they, you know, are still dealing with some injuries at their corner spots. Um, they are still dealing with George Kittle's injury, even though he could be active. And I just think, again, if you put Byron Murphy on Debo Samuel or double Debo, let everybody else try to make plays for the Niners. They really don't want to make any more. They really don't want to make any plays for anybody else on the Niners if it isn't Debo or Kittle. And I just think the Cardinals are just a more effective and a more well-balanced team compared to the Niners at this point. Should be an interesting game because you can throw the records out the window with the Cardinals, giving a better quarterback, giving a better confidence. And the Niners have won one home game in the last since last year. They, they've gone over a year without winning a home game, and I think that streak continues for at least another couple weeks until I believe they have they get the Texans, they get the host of Texans at home. And I'll tell you this with their schedule, I don't have it right in front of me. I believe the Niners lose the rest of their home games going up in that Houston game. If Tyrod plays, who knows if Houston can't beat San Francisco to hopefully put the nail in Kyle Shanahan's coaching call. So, so that's like the Arizona Cardinals here, minus two and a half, and the Arizona Cardinals straight up. And in the final two games, the Los Angeles Rams over the Tennessee Titans. Um, Derrick Henry, it's a very sad day for me. As someone that picked Derrick Henry, number one, and anybody out there that picked Derrick Henry in your fantasy leagues, come speak to me. Voice your frustration. Voice your pain. As... With this announcement, Derrick Henry has suffered a Jones fracture in his foot. Or, I'm sorry, he broke the fifth metatarsal in his foot. And he is now at least out six to ten weeks. So that will very likely be, in my opinion, the rest of the Titans season. Um, maybe if they make the playoffs, he could be back for that wall guard game that is pushing it. But that's what it looks like we're seeing here. Um, and just with the Rams adding Von Miller, the Titans offensive line already having some issues. Ryan Tannehill will not be able to throw, especially Julio Jones being out. There is just so much going on for the Titans and for the Rams kind of in a way to where, like, you lose Derrick Henry. Julio Jones is on, on a hamstring injury. Your corners are out with Christian or Christian Fulham's dealing with an injury. Uh, you have Caleb Farley out for the year. You have... They really have no tight end. A.J. Brown's been phenomenal, but Ryan Tannehill's been turning it over way more often. 
And now you've got Jalen Von Miller and Aaron Donald as a defense going up against a Titans team of A.J. Brown, possibly Julio, no running game. They're just going to make Tannehill. They're going to trust Tannehill to throw the football, and it's not very good. And the last few times everybody sees the Titans on primetime television, they do not win that many games on Sunday Night Football. The last time they played on Sunday Night Football was against the Packers last year. They got shellacked. I feel like with everything going on with Vaughn coming in, with the injury to Derek, with the injuries to Julio, with the injuries in the secondary, with Taylor LeJuan still kind of dealing with concussion syndromes, it's going to be a long day for Titans fans on Sunday Night Football. And I feel like the Rams, just with, with the news from what we heard from the positive for the Rams, and the negative for the Titans, this line will go up huge. I think it'll be at least 7 to 8 points with Derek being out. But just take the Rams. Just clearly a better football team. The Titans will be reeling. And Ryan Tannehill cannot carry this team on his arm. And I heard they might bring in Adrian Peterson. That will help their running game. But a 37-year-old Adrian Peterson is not, nothing like a Derrick Henry in the prime of his career. Uh, real tough blow for Titans fans. And the Titans manager, I feel really bad for them. But it makes this game just a very much easier and the digestible pick to make. Take the Rams. More fully healthy. They're going to bring in Von Miller. The defense is going to be amazingly stout and dominant. And we're going to really see now, can the Rams, if they beat the Packers, can they jump that number one spot and they can beat the Cardinals and they will have essentially been every top team in the conference and they should be the favorite if they win those two games as the overall favorite to get to the Super Bowl in their own stadium. A crazy thing. Back-to-back years, possibly, you could have the one of the home teams of the respective Super Bowl stadiums play in their building uh, for, the, for the Vince Lombardi Trophy. So I think that's pretty cool. And in a while. So that's why I like the uh, Los Angeles Rams here minus six and a half and the Los Angeles Rams straight up. And finally, the Pittsburgh Steelers over the Chicago Bears. Pittsburgh's defense wins another close one against Justin Fields. Justin Fields played pretty well. He was the third quarterback in uh, Rams history to have 100 plus rushing yards, 100 plus passing yards, a passing and rushing touchdown. But at the end of the day, he threw a tough interception. They really couldn't um, they, he made some nice throws. Daryl Mooney, though, led the team in receiving. Allen Robinson, their $18 million paid man, was at the bottom. And it just feels like every time Justin Fields has an okay game, when he plays up a good, against a good defense, he ends up having a real tough time struggling with the ball, with not turning it over. And I do think that Justin Fields will have at least two turnovers in this game. And I just feel like with Jimmy Garoppolo rushing for two touchdowns, Elijah Mitchell running for another 20 yards, I feel like Najee Harris should be the difference maker in this game. They're going to give Najee Harris at least 20 to the 30 touches, and I, I think they grind out another tough, difficult game to improve the 5-3. and three. And maybe People may not believe in the offense and believe the Big Ben can keep winning these types of games, but I think at the end of the day, with, when they get some of their receivers back, when they, you know, just kind of keep playing through, Ben should, you know, be able to lift this team and just kind of tug it all the way to a playoff berth, but very well possible with the game they have coming up tonight against the Bears. Should be an old school rugged blue collar game. So I, I am excited about that. But give me the Steelers here. Better defense. Justin Fields has had a tough time against dominating pass rushers with phenomenal talent on either side. That's Pittsburgh. Even with TJ Watt. TJ Watt's going to introduce himself to Justin Fields. It's going to be a long night for the Bears in Pittsburgh in a very interesting game. So that's like the Pittsburgh Steelers here. Minus four and a half and the Pittsburgh Steelers straight up. All right, so those are my thoughts and comments for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Please check out other NFL YouTube prognosticators such as Keith Bailey, Spat Sports Talk, Andrew Warren, Bridgewater's Finest, Half Moon's Picks, The Goat House, RD Take with Philly, uh, Sports Fan Entertainment. If you check any of those people out on YouTube, uh, please give them a like and tell them that, I, that you came over here for me to see them. The Boston, uh, got the Boston Sports Report guy, you know, shout out to him. Uh, he... Gave me a comment yesterday, uh, last week, and I wanted to say thank you, and I'll subscribe to him, so please check him out. And that is it. So until next week, good luck to all teams, players, coaches, fantasy players, and fellow prognosticators. And until next week, this is Matthew Radic signing off. Until next time, so long.